Okay, this panel is uh, Digital Divides and Online Manipulation from Detection to Prevention. And we have five speakers joining us. Our first speaker is Mo um, Mohsen Mosla, a senior lecturer at the University of Exeter. Our second speaker is Almog Simon from the University of Bristol. Then we have Jason Reifler, professor of political science at the University of Exeter, Fabio Carella, senior research associate at the University of Bristol, and Don Halford, senior research associate at the University of Bristol. And we'll be taking questions at the end. Hello everyone, my name is Mosa Mosle. I just came from University of Exeter. Today I'm going to talk about a project we did on measuring exposure to misinformation from political elites. So a cornerstone of the study of misinformation is to how to identify uh, this kind of like questionable content on the internet. So one common way of doing so is to use a list of domains that are uh, rated as untrustworthy by professional fact checkers and identify users who share content from those kind of websites. It's been used a lot by many researchers, but at the same time, it needs the user active engagement with this kind of content, user share content from this website. Also, it accounts for a small portion of the social media ecosystem that, that is, these are the random fake news website that are around for a while and then they just disappear and then we need to uh, uh, collect a new list of bad domains from political, uh, for, from the fact checkers and so on. But what about misinformation that comes from political elite, in particular being exposed to false content from political elite? For example, the famous case of the, you know, false claims by Republican about the fraud in US 2020 election. Just one example, looking at this scorecard by uh, PolitiFact about the previous US President, uh, US President Donald Trump, and you can see more than half of the uh, claims made by the previous US President fact-checked by PolitiFact were found to be false. And at the time, Donald Trump had more than millions of followers, like around 80 or 90 million followers, and all of these followers were exposed to this kind of false content. And thanks to Elon Musk, this account is activated again on, face, on Twitter, so again, people are exposed to this kind of content. So in order to measure the exposure to this kind of false content made by, made by political elites, we seek out to introduce a simple measure, particularly on Twitter. So what we did was that we gathered around 800 uh, entities from PolitiFact. These are around 800 uh, US political elites who were fact-checked at least three times by the fact-checking website PolitiFact. We then mapped that into their Twitter account. So for each entity on uh, PolitiFact, we find associated Twitter account. Then for each elite, we calculated a falsity score based on the results of the ratings from PolitiFact. From the uh, true all the way to pants on fire, mapping into a score of zero to one, and whatever I'm presenting here also holds true if we use other linear mapping between these category of variables and the rating. So we averaged over the ratings from the PolitiFact and we came up with a falsity score for each political elite. Now, we introduce our misinformation exposure score by simply averaging over falsity score of all elites a user follows on Twitter. Now, we wanted to see how this misinformation exposure score we just introduced relates to different features of the users who follow these kind of good versus bad elites in terms of the content as rated by 
professional fact checker website, Hortifact. To explore this, we sample around 5,000 Twitter users who followed at least three elites from our list of 800 political elites who, for whom we have these positive scores from the fact checking website, Hortifact. We gathered all their uh, tweets. We extracted the tweets. We look at the URLs. We also collected all accounts they followed on Twitter so that we can investigate the content they shared as well as uh, the accounts they commonly follow on this platform. So the first thing that we look at was the relationship between our measure of misinformation exposure and the commonly used way of rating the quality of content people share on Twitter. So on the x-axis here, I have the uh, misinformation exposure score calculated as I just described, and on the y-axis, I have the fact checkers trustworthiness rating of the content people shared on Twitter. As you can see, we find a significant and negative relationship between the two, that is, you know, being more exposed to misinformation from political elite is associated with sharing more low-quality content as rated by professional fact checkers. You know, there's always this claim about the professional fact checkers being politically biased and like negatively evaluate content from the right-leaning uh, uh, news outlet. So we also look at the relationship between our measure of misinformation exposure and the quality of content rated by a crowd of politically balanced lay American people, and we found similar patterns. We also look at the misinformation exposure score and political ideology, and we found a line with the prior work in the literature that more conservative users are more likely to be exposed to misinformation from political elite as measured by our misinformation exposure score. Similarly, we look at misinformation exposure score and the average toxicity of language used among the user in our sample and this is using the Google Jigsaw Perspective API. And we found that you know, being more exposed to misinformation from political elite is also associated with sharing more toxic language on the platform. Furthermore, we look at the network level. So in order to see what are the accounts are commonly followed by those who have high versus low uh, misinformation exposure score, we constructed a network within our sample. So we first constructed this bipartite network of the users and the accounts they follow. So on one hand, we have the list of users, and on the other hand, we have all the accounts they followed on Twitter. So this is like a huge network with millions of rows, millions of nodes, and then we collapse that network into a monograph network where we have two, each node represents an account followed by users in our sample, and the link between two nodes represents the common followers. So two nodes are connected if they share a follower, and the weight of that network is, uh, is, the, is proportional to the number of common followers within our sample. Having this network, we could apply different network analysis techniques, in particular looking at the clustering or the modularity index or community structure within this network. So having done that, we came up with three clusters. So each cluster is the uh, um, accounts followed by users in our sample, and those nodes are closer to each other if they share more followers. We see that there are three distinct clusters within this network. One is the more kind of like left-leaning accounts. The other one is more kind of like center or center left-leaning accounts. And there is a one that's more kind of like right-leaning accounts. Now, I can look at the characteristics of these accounts as represented by the characteristics, average characteristics of their followers from our sample. If for each node or in each uh, node in our network, we could average the ideology of people who follow this account. So obviously we have this kind of like right-leaning uh, 
cluster of the accounts. And if you look at the uh, misinformation exposure of this cluster, we can see a similar pattern we just observed in the individual level, also as the network level. That is the cluster of the accounts that are followed mostly by conservative users also is the same cluster of the accounts that uh, are more exposed to misinformation. At the other level, we'll look at the relationship between the uh, extremity of the political ideology and being exposed to misinformation from political elite. We found a asymmetry in terms of exposure that is more extreme users are more likely to be exposed to misinformation from multiple elite where, where for the uh, right-leaning users, whereas we did not observe that pattern for the liberal users. So as you can see here, being more extreme is more kind of like, more li you're more likely to be exposed to misinformation from political elites, whereas this slope is much lower for the liberal users. We built a tool on, uh, we, we built a public tool on the, uh, on the following website, Misinformation Exposure, where you can put the username of any given uh, Twitter handle, a Twitter account, or both in terms of like the Twitter user account, as well as their screen names, to get back their ideology, as well as the level of being exposed to misinformation. We also made a public API service so you can send requests to our servers uh, to get all these, um, um, uh, uh, you know, scores both in terms of ideology and misinformation exposure for a large set of users. We tested this for more than 300 million users, which is almost more than half of the active users on the platform. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my, my name is Almog. I'm a um, postdoc at the University of Bristol. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, micro-targeting. And uh, first I'd like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators here, uh, Adam Sutton, Matthew Edwards, and Steve Lewandowski uh, sitting over here. So let's, let's talk about the micro-targeting manipulation machine. And this is the idea that uh, you could target people based on uh, social media um, data and extract the psychological characteristic um, and, and then tailor specific messages that are supposed to be more persuasive to their uh, psychological characteristic. And, um, and I think that the concern is that um, this will be done in uh, political, um, political aspect. So whether this uh, persuasion attempt will be for political action or inaction. Now, uh, this obviously resonates with uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, in which the company targeted people based on uh, their personality and was involved in uh, the Trump and Brexit campaigns in over 60 countries. Um, however, uh, Cambridge Analytica um, is no longer in business. Uh, but the micro-targeting industry uh, is far from over. And um, I would like us to think of how we can protect ourselves from such manipulations. And the only, well, after thinking about this, the, pretty much the only um, um, thing that comes to mind for us is uh, that we need algorithmic transparency. We need to know how the manipulation machine is designed, whether is it a it is effective, and only then we can build um, effective uh, interventions uh, to try to curtail these um, effects. So uh, this is what my talk is going to be, uh, <laughs> is going to uh, address. Um, now I don't have the microphone. Basically from detection and action, and we'll leave the prevention for another time. Um, but um, we need to know how this uh, machine is designed. 
designed and whether it is effective. So um, let's start with the detection and how we, um, and how we uh, try to tackle this. So um, to understand uh, whether a particular message uh, is tailored to Alice or Bob or Steve, um, we need to know the personality of the user, but we also need to know the personality of the target audience. So we we'll have a way to, uh, to see if those two align. And uh, this is what we're trying to do with uh, some text modeling. Um, we had uh, developed two models. Um, one which is based on the text that people write in order to infer their personality. And the other uh, model is uh, about the text that they consume, what they read, and uh, from that uh, trying to predict the, um, what type of language is more um, um, more appealing to different personalities. And uh, the way that we did this um, was with uh, two different models. Um, the first model, as I told you, this is the model that uh, is uh, predicting or trying to model personality from the text that people write. So what we did was uh, basically uh, go to uh, Reddit, a social media platform, and um, and we recruited about 1,100 participants who uh, gave us um, their uh, personalities from uh, personality inventory, and also their, they consented for us to model their comments uh, through Reddit, so we can build a machine learning model that predicts their personality from the text that they write. In the second model, uh, what we did was building on the first model and expanding it. So we went and had um, a larger sample of Reddit users, and we collected their uh, text that they wrote. We applied the first model, which was uh, basically to get their predicted personality, and then we went and saw what type of, um, um, what type of post, what type of text they read on Reddit. This was on fiction writing communities. And only on text that they posted that they commented something positively on, so we know that they read it and we know that they have a favorable opinion on it, we model this. So uh, I don't have the time to get into the, uh, uh, the details of the model, but what you do need to understand here is that we have two different models. One is from predicting the personality of people from the text that they write, and the second is from the predicting the personality of people from the text that they read. And how do the models uh, uh, perform? Uh, what we have here is the Pearson correlation uh, with the different personality dimensions. Uh, this is, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, big five uh, personality model, these are different dimensions of personality from the big five. And uh, on the first model that predicts the personality of people from the text that they write, we have uh, a correlation of about 0.33 in average, which is, within the state-of-the-art estimates of what we know about predicting personality. Um, so uh, this is, while it's not uh, novel, it was because this is something that had been done before, it's still something that was important for our model to, uh, to get because this was the only uh, way to get the second model, which is the prediction of personality from the text that people consume. And as you see, uh, the uh, the predictions here are not as good as in the first model. It's, uh, uh, it's much more indirect. However, um, this is the first time that, as long as um, we know that this is, has been attempted, so there is no, um, um, there is no uh, a baseline. And we actually uh, see this as evidence that it is indeed possible to uh, detect the type of text that is more persuasive to different personalities on um, on uh, uh, social media. So um, we have a way that perhaps uh, can detect such attempts, but is it really more persuasive? Um, so uh, when it comes to the persuasion, whether it is indeed effective to have micro-targeting um, 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 ads, what we did was uh, to go to Facebook and um, we collected about uh, 1,500 uh, ads, uh, political ads from Facebook. And we applied our model that's supposed to tell us how 
persuasive or how appealing it is to uh, people of different personalities, specifically on the openness, um, um, on the openness scale. We selected some of those items and to be validated by, uh, um, by participants. And we saw that indeed uh, what the model thinks that it's supposed to be appealing to people of uh, high, people are high on openness or low on openness. This is indeed what people think it's supposed to be. So we have this validation of uh, humans and also what our computational model says, which is nice. It's only a validation, but is it really more persuasive? I'll uh, tell you this in a minute, but just so we can have this in context of what it means for the model and for people to say, well, this is an ad that's supposed to appeal to uh, people low on openness, so this is the type of ad. And you can uh, uh, read it right, so avoid traveling unless essential for work, education, or other permitted uh, exemption, or this is supposed to be for low on openness or high on openness. Uh, check out this. Uh, uh, Dr. Susan uh, uh, Oman's visually stunning digital exhibition, right? So you can actually see the different uh, types of ads here that's supposed to be more appealing to the people of different personalities. So is it more effective? Um, what we did is to uh, try this in a pre-registered um, uh, experiment and um, we gave uh, participants the different uh, ads and, um, and we collected their, um, their personality on an openness to experience scale. And, uh, and what we see is that it is indeed more persuasive. So on the orange here, you can see the ads that are supposed to be appealing to people of high openness to experience. So on the X axis, you can see the actual personality of those uh, of the participants, and on the Y axis, the persuasiveness rate. So people who are high on openness to experience do rate ads that are supposed to be high on openness as more persuasive, and people who are low on openness to experience uh, rate those ads as less persuasive. Um, so you can see that through this interaction. Uh, however, we don't see it what the model predicts to be low in openness to experience. I have a theory about this, but uh, we can talk about it uh, later if you want. Um, so um, just to, to uh, sum this up, um, we, um, we wanted to understand whether uh, we can detect those, uh, the, um, the manipulation machine, and whether, um, to understand how it is designed, and we have that through the tax modeling. Um, we wanted to know whether this is an effective strategy, and we do find evidence that it is indeed effective. Um, and I told you that I'm not going to talk about the prevention uh, today and the plans for prevention, but I do want to say uh, a little something about how easy it is to, um, to disseminate those in the age of generative AI. So, um, I, I guess uh, most of you know about ChatGPT and GPT-3, the new language models that can generate uh, text uh, really easily and, 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 and very well. So, uh, what we did in, in just to, to understand how people can use this in, for the manipulation machine is to feed the, um, we fed the model with the original ad. This is the ad saying, vaccines should be available to everyone, everywhere, tell Boris Johnson to take action. And we told GPT-3, well, generate this ad to be persuasive to people high on openness. And this is what GPT-3 said. Um, now experience the extraordinary and join the global movement for universal access to vaccines, sign up now, and help make sure everyone everywhere can benefit from the power of vaccines. And we told GPT-3 again to, do it for people who are low on openness. And then it says, protect yourself and your family, get your vaccines and stay safe, take the traditional approach and join the fight against the disease, tell Boris Johnson to take action now. We did this for the entire data set that we have, and indeed we find significant differences where our model predicts to be low or high on openness with the uh, actual GPT-generated ads. So um, coming back to the idea 
of the manipulation machine. I think that this is something that uh, we should be concerned about and we should strive to make our online spaces uh, safer and more transparent. And we need this type of research and research of all of you to uh, understand how we can do that. And thank you for uh, your attention. Um, okay, uh, hi, my name is uh, Jason Reifler. Uh, I'm at the University of Exeter, and I'm going to talk some about uh, YouTube and the YouTube algorithm and whether or not it uh, radicalizes um, folks. So there are reasons why we might want to be uh, concerned about YouTube. It's one of the most consumed uh, websites and social media platforms uh, on the internet over uh, one billion hours of content watched every day. That's a lot. Um, my kids are definitely a non-negligible percentage of that. My wife and I probably should be more uh, attentive to what they're watching. Um, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Um, in 2018, in the New York Times, um, uh, Zeynep Tufeki made this really powerful claim, and, and this has been uh, a part of talks that she's been giving for a while, which is that the YouTube algorithm radicalizes people. That you start watching one piece of content, and before you know it, you are into like really, really extreme versions of this. And this has potentially really strong implications for things that are related to um, uh, politics or um, um, and, and getting people to more extreme, uh, somebody whose hobby is cooking, um, the first time I heard this talk, I've always been disappointed that I'm not being brought to more extreme cooking techniques. Um, maybe I'm already very extreme uh, in my cooking. Um, so there are, oh, I can't read the, the text of that one back there, so I'm gonna have to look up here. Um, so the um, YouTube, in response to some of these critiques, made some rather substantial changes to its algorithm and uh, in rather self-congratulatory fashion has said, look, we've been able to drastically reduce the amount of bad content that's consumed on our platform um, and that we've changed our algorithm and now things are much better. Uh, there has been more mixed evidence in terms of uh, evaluations of the algorithm and, and YouTube as a platform uh, more recently. Um, uh, but one of the sort of big narratives that continues to stay out there is, are people falling down these algorithmic rabbit holes of being brought to ever more um, extreme content? So we look at this in the context of um, alternative and extreme right-wing content um, in the United States and the extent to which uh, um, uh, viewers are uh, watching bad content, so getting a, a sense of how much alternative and extremist uh, right-wing content is being watched in the first place. Uh, and then from there, do we see people being given recommendations to more of that content, and is that further radicalizing them and taking them into content they may not uh, have otherwise seen? So the approach of our study is um, we have a uh, sample, uh, a survey, we, we do a survey with uh, a bunch of respondents drawn from three separate populations and participants in our survey were uh, incentivized and consented into installing a browser extension that then recorded what they were doing on YouTube. So we can actually see what they are doing and we can now tie it back to um, attitudinal and demographic markers to see who is consuming more or less. And also, because we're seeing what they're doing on platform, we're getting the, the panel, what to watch next panel, and so we know what specifically um, is being recommended to them. Um, all the results that I'm going to present are weighted back to reflect uh, the U.S. Uh, population um, and we take our alternative and extremist channel definitions from a variety of expert um, sources um, 
to scholars. We will spread the list around, but we don't um, publish the full list to avoid amplification of um, alternative and extremist content. Um, so here are um, the different types of content that people view. So the yellow is alternative uh, content. The red is extremist content. The blue is mainstream media. And white is everything else. And so the way to read this graph um, is alternative content is 2.7% of the consumption that we see in our sample. Um, extreme watching videos from extremist channels is just less than half a percent. Um, watching mainstream media news sources is about 5%, and everything else, as you might expect, is a lot. Now, within these sets of charts, uh, the cross-hatching means that people are subscribed to that channel. So the vast majority of what people are watching is uh, when they're watching alternative and extremist content, it's because they're already subscribed to that channel. Um, the next is, means that they're subscribed to another channel of the same category. So these folks are watching an alternative, uh, a video from an alternative channel, the alt-right, um, and are not subscribed to the current channel, but are subscribed to another alt-right uh, channel. And then there's the share of people um, who are subscribed to not that channel nor any other of the same category and are then consuming it. So we can see already that um, uh, the vast majority of people are already subscribed to this uh, type of content. And this is uh, even more dramatic in the uh, extremist, um, less so in the news. And then just for completeness, we have all of this. But this uh, covers literally everything else in YouTube. It covers the cooking videos I watch, the uh, Disney princess videos that my younger daughter watches, the uh, Harry Potter uh, um, backstory videos that she watches, and I don't actually know exactly what my older daughter watches these days. That's probably bad. Um, here is uh, um, two figures showing the same data, that the majority of the consumption of alternative and extremist content is concentrated in a small set of super users or super consumers. Um, so it only takes um, you, know, a, a, you know, it's a very, very small percentage of the user base that's accounting for 75 plus percent of the consumption. Um, now, this is the case across all types of content. But you can see it's much more dramatic for the um, alternative and extremist types of content. Um, this figure here shows the predictors of consumption of uh, ex uh, alternative, extremist, and mainstream uh, media. <clears throat> now, our assumption going in was that um, things related to racial resentment and uh, hostile sexism as markers of things that are uh, fairly uh, predominant uh, tropes and thematic elements of alt-right and extremist content. Um, so we had batteries measuring those, and we find that those are positively associated with uh, the consumption of alternative and extremist content. Uh, now, going into this, our assumption had been that it's actually the racial resentment, um, uh, given the sort of rise of white nationalism in the uh, United States, that would be the stronger predictor. If you have only one of these two in the model, both are significant, but once you include both, um, it's actually hostile sexism that's doing the, the majority of the work. So that um, was one of the interesting findings that, that um, it's not perfectly in line with what we uh, expected. Um, so here is a uh, uh, waffle, a series of waffle plots 
that uh, focuses on given a type of channel that you are currently watching, what are the types of channels that are being um, recommended? So if you're watching an alternative channel, each one of these little plot boxes shows you what 1% of the recommendations are and what type of channel they're coming from. So approximately 34% of recommendations shown on a video from an alternative channel are to other videos from alternative channels. Um, just 3% are to extremist, and then we have some news content, and then we have everything else. Um, for extremist channels, you can see, again, the modal is to recommendations to other ex videos from other extremist channels, um, some to uh, alternative and to uh, mainstream. Now, when you're in mainstream uh, media, only a very small percentage are you, of, uh, of recommendations are to al videos from alternative channels. Um, and if you're on everything else, um, again, even smaller, and almost no recommendations to videos from uh, extremist channels. Uh, now here is a, what is actually being followed. So the first is what's being shown. Given what's being shown, what are you following? Um, and we do see here that it's a little bit higher. If you're watching an alternative channel, there's higher of actually following, conditional on being recommended, same with uh, extremists, same within uh, mainstream, same with another channel. So if you're watching something, you're likely to uh, watch another video um, of the same type. Um, but what we don't see, and I think this is crucial, is we don't see, particularly in the alternative channels here, we don't see really large proportions moving on to uh, the extremist channels. And when we're in the mainstream and other, we don't see really large percentages going into the alternative or into the um, extreme. So this brings us to the uh, sort of larger question of how prevalent and common are rabbit holes on YouTube? On YouTube, And in our data, uh, given our sample, we don't find a lot of evidence of this. Um, that is, if you start with um, how often are people watching these, and then taking into account if they watched it, were they recommended that video? So in order for it to be an algorithmic rabbit hole, they have to watch it. It has to be something that they've been recommended to watch, so it means not being drawn, taken in from off-platform sources. It has to be something that is more extreme based on our categories than what people have previously watched. So if it's going, taking you to something more extreme, which is the uh, sort of premise of the rabbit hole, um, and it has to be a channel that you're not already subscribed to. So if you're already subscribed to, you have taken a concrete step to say, you like this type of content. And once we go through all of those steps and narrow it down, uh, we find only what we call uh, 108 rabbit hole events. That is, people going through this full chain of the YouTube algorithm radicalizing um, them. Um, so you might think this sort of lets YouTube off the hook. I don't, I don't think that's exactly the, the conclusion there. I think that um, one of the things to point out is this content is still available on YouTube. Um, the uh, extent of um, subscribing is really letting people access these channels and it gives, it makes it prevalent in their feed. So there's a platform feature subscribing to a channel that makes this content uh, surface and be uh, really um, prevalent for folks. Um, in fact, you can even see this in some of YouTube's, if you, once you know this and you parse their statements about how much good work they've done, they 
make their statement sort of conditional and it says um, we've cut the uh, exposure to viewing uh, bad content uh, to non-subscribed channels. There's this sort of non-subscribed uh, qualifier in their self-congratulatory um, text. So um, the, there isn't strong evidence that the algorithm is currently radicalizing. Our study period was done after YouTube changes. So all of the bad things that people said before may well have been true. We are not saying that uh, those things aren't true. Um, there are, I think, a lot of sort of broader questions over we don't find zero uh, radicalization or rabbit hole events. So at what level is our rabbit hole events a problem? Is our level, the small level that we observe, is that still potentially a problem? It may well be. Would more finely grained uh, uh, coatings of alternative through extremist, where we could more finely chop up going to more extreme, would that allow us to see more? That would be um, another possibility. Um, and I think I'm out of time. And then that's something very cute that my older daughter did that I sometimes do in talks when I have time. But Steve has given me the, the watch sign, so I don't. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fabio. And I'm going to present you a study that is actually a little bit of work in progress and whose provisional title is on the screen and has, it's quite clickbaiting, I have to admit, so the truth contagion effect. Um, this is part of a bigger study, of a, actually, of a, yeah, of a, it's part of a project. It's called the Honesty Project. That is a joint project between the University of Bristol and the Technical University of Graz. So uh, just for a little bit of context, what we are interested in is to understand, I can't read that, to understand uh, how honesty is perceived and valued uh, in political discourse, more precisely in the US political discourse. And we do this, well, we started to do that uh, considering a tripartite framework of honesty, the one you see on the screen here on the right, but then we switch to a bipartite model of truth that is fairly similar to the one you, see, you, you still see on the screen, but we kind of dropped this uh, dimension, the fostering understanding dimension for our study. So what we're doing is, we kind of, um, our hypothesis is that honesty seems to be a unified concept. So someone should be considered, especially politicians should be considered honest when they tell the truth or seek to do so. So this truth seeking dimension. But our idea is that honesty kind of fractured over time in, in um, more than one dimension, giving birth to this belief-speaking dimension, meaning someone can be considered honest, as in the case of populist uh, figures, uh, when they simply tell what's on their mind, when they simply defy the, mm, the, the, the truth thinking dimension itself. Um, so what we did was to, uh, we, start, we, we started, like, wanted to observe the presence of these two dimensions in uh, US political discourse, more precisely in tweets. So we developed uh, two lists of keywords, one for each dimension. We refined that through survey, and we used word embeddings to see the similarity between the dictionaries and the tweets that we had. And you can see that in 2016, both dimensions actually increased their presence in the tweets that we analyzed, and this is regardless of the party considered. Um, another more interesting thing I have to say is the relationship that we found between the information quality, so the quality of, um, of the information shared by a politician in the US, and the dimension that I was talking about. So you can see that, especially, oh, better, only for Republicans, there is a negative correlation between the belief speaking in the tweets and the information quality. Now, the information quality is measured using NewsGuard, which is a, a fact-checking service, and you can see that the more a tweet is belief speaking, for, in a way, the less, uh, so the, the more the quality of the information goes down. And the opposite is true for the truth-seeking uh, score that we had. Democrats don't, see to show, don't seem to show any kind of effect. Um, starting from this, we, uh, we are currently, and this is where the truth contagion um, uh, comes into place, 
So what we're doing now is to consider the, um, the audience re uh, reaction. So we have a set of replies to the tweets we collected, and we, wanted to see, we want to see two things at the same time. So the first is kind of how the components that we've seen, so the belief-speaking and the truth-seeking components, align between the tweet and the replies that the tweet originates, creates, right, triggers. So there are several hypotheses. For example, a belief-speaking belief tweet can trigger belief-speaking replies or can trigger uh, truth-seeking replies or nothing happens. And the second kind of study is the relationship between the honesty components and the polarization. When I say polarization, I mean effective polarization in the replies that we collected. So what we are actually seeing is that there is a sort of contagion effect in place, meaning that um, when we model, when we see belief speaking in a reply as a dependent variable in two models, here you can see that there is a positive estimate of belief tweets. This belief tweet is just the belief speaking of the tweet. And there is a negative estimate of truth seeking, which is, however, not significant. And when we do the same for truth seeking in the replies, you can see the opposite, meaning that truth seeking in the tweet triggers truth seeking replies, and uh, belief speaking seems to have a negative relation with truth seeking in the replies. When we split this by party and by ideological affiliation of the repliers, we see more or less the same. So we calculated the ideology score of the, of the people who replied using um, Mosler's actually um, score, and we sorry, yeah, um, and we um, and we can see that the contagion effect is still in place. Now, sorry for the, the small font, but. You have, on the left, you have two graphs. On the y-axis, you have the belief speaking polarization score. And here you have the belief of the reply, sorry, the belief speaking um, uh, score of the replies and the belief speaking, speaking score of the tweet. And you can see there is a positive correlation between the two. This is regardless of party and of uh, ideology of the repliers. On the right, you have the truth seeking of the tweet and shows how this is negatively affiliated with the belief speaking score of the replies. And you can see the opposite uh, effect for the, when you have the truth seeking reply score on the y-axis. So you can see there is a positive correlation between the truth, truth seeking score of the replies and the truth seeking score of the tweets. Um, as far as the polarization analysis goes, we see that there is, oh, so first of all, we calculated the, the polarization use of a vocabulary approach developed by Almog, uh, Simhon, and uh, we can see that the two components have um, an opposite effect. So on the left, you have, uh, so on both graphs, you have the polarization of the replies, that so this is just the uh, relative frequency of polarizing words in a, in a reply, so on both y-axis. And on the left here, you have the belief speaking score of the tweet. Um, and you can see there is a positive correlation between the belief uh, speaking uh, uh, score of the tweets and the polarizing words that, um, that the replies contain. And at the same time, there is a negative correlation with the truth seeking score of the tweets and the polarizing uh, words that the reply contain. So to sum up, um, we can see that, so starting from the contagion effect study, we can see that the tone of the conversation, meaning, is determined by the initiating politician. Now, one can say, well, that's kind of obvious because if I tweet uh, something emotional, I'm probably going to receive emotional replies back. But that's a good thing I have to say, meaning that if we can, uh, in a way, convince that um, at least um, in a political context, at least in social media, maybe framing uh, communication in a certain way could improve communication itself, the, the sanity of the conversation, that could be a good thing to do. Now, I don't want to say that belief speaking is bad itself and truth seeking is, the, is, is, is a good thing, but still we found that, at least in this study, belief speaking was positively correlated with both polarization and misinformation. So maybe itself is not a bad thing, but it can be used by certain actors as a bad framing narrative. Um, so thank you very much, that's all. that right okay yes still still audible good okay so um, I'm Don Holford I'm from the University of Bristol and my talk I'm going to close this session with a talk on 
it, um, an intervention against polarization in online spaces. Now, coming at the end of four talks talking about the problems, this feels like very much a tiny drop in the bucket, but there we go. Um, so this is work that is led by our, our very brilliant student, uh, Finton Smith, and collaborators, Almog and Stephen Lewandowski. Um, so after we've heard those four talks about how our online spaces are structured, it's probably no surprise to see that well, our discourse, our societies are getting more and more polarized like that figure shows. Um, and we see this in our online spaces and the content that's uh, shared there on our social media accounts and the web. Um, here are some examples of headlines that uh, you can see use uh, sort of attacks on individuals or ad hominem attacks. They use very emotional language to try and grab attention. And I think the important, the critical thing here is that it's very derogatory towards someone who's on the opposite side of an issue. Uh, so basically, really uh, inflam using very inflammatory language uh, against people who are on the opposite of an issue to you. Um, so, and a lot of this we also see is spread by people just like you and me. There are, of course, disinformation and political actors putting it out there, but what we want to, wanted to see was, well, how do we stop people engaging with this? Because we know that engagement also feeds the algorithms that recommend more, um, and it also gets that information spread around. So we approach this from the question of, well, why, first of all, why do people share that information? Why do they engage with it? Um, and this isn't a, there isn't a really a simple answer to that question. It's quite a complex issue. There's many factors at play. Some of you may have come across uh, the Penny Cook and Rand model, sort of, where it's accuracy that's playing an issue, where people maybe are uncertain about the accuracy or they don't think about it. And so when they're sharing this information, um, they're, not actually, they're, they're unintentionally sharing it because they don't know it's misinformation. Now, that's one mod way to look at it. But when we're looking at polarized content specifically, I think we have to consider that there are other issues at play, and it may well be oh, yep, um, that people are sharing it as a sort of partisanship behavior. So because of this existing and increasing polarization in society, uh, people want to share content that supports their particular in-group, um, and maybe attacks the other outgroup without considering the, how that actually increases that polarization in the, and the hostilities in the environment that they're operating in. So this is the pathway that we tried to um, address with our intervention. Um, and we looked to the literature on psychological inoculation for this. And so very briefly, psychological inoculation is just sort of um, exposing, pre-exposing people to a weakened dose of the rhetorical techniques used in creating harmful content, or put another way, we're warning people about the misleading strategies that is used um, to create harmful content. Um, and this intervention has been shown to be effective uh, in many domains, such as climate change against radicalization and COVID-19. So for us, we were looking to apply that um, in, in, depolarization, uh, in the depolarization of online spaces. Uh, so our, our student, Finton, he came up with this video. So it's 90 seconds long, but because this is a short talk, I'm just going to play you the 40 seconds in the middle that has the sort of key components so you get a flavor of what it's like. Um, if I could get some help playing that, because I can't, I don't, I'm not sure if that works. We're angry about a political issue. It can be tempting to get personal and attack people we disagree with online. The hate pushers know this and flood social media with content that engages us and makes us more hateful towards those we disagree with. They often use a few tactics to do this, which can be pretty easy to spot. Scapegoating posts pin the blame for a problem on a particular group of people unfairly and without justification. Ad hominem attacks target people not for what they say or do, but instead their character. Unnecessary emotional language will be used to suck you in and make you feel angry and afraid. This content damages our democracies and divides us all, and that's not good for anyone. So when you see posts online like these, be aware, you may be being manipulated. Right, so yes, you can see the video explains some of the techniques that are used to mislead and uh, create divides among people. Um, so we brought this into the lab, uh, and we've done three experiments on this that I'm going to be sharing now. And they've basically used this experimental design. So our participants came from the uh, polling company YouGov. Uh, and they sort of click on a YouGov survey and they go into the experiment, which first thing we do is randomize them into either an inoculation or control condition. So in the inoculation condition, they see that warning video. 
Uh, in the control condition, they see a video of similar length. I've just shown you an example there, which is uh, basically just describes the si structure of the British political system. And then after that, watching that video, we show them a bunch of headlines. Um, now, critically, the headlines, there are two types of them. And one of them, uh, and they differ in terms of the intensity of that polarization. So these are headlines that are about this, um, a specific issue. I'll explain the issues in a, a second. We tried them with a couple of issues. Um, and one sort of headline is what we call effective um, headlines. Headlines. So the effective stimuli includes derogatory comments, specifically derogating the outgroup. And then the other type of headlines is sort of issue based. So these are headlines that are not exactly positive about the specific issue. However, they do not contain that inflammatory content. So we presented these headlines in random order, so within subjects design uh, to our participants. And for each of the headlines, participants, we got a measure of engagement. So we'd ask them, how likely are you to share this? How likely are you? to click on uh, that content, um, and that formed our dependent variable that we're interested in. Okay, so uh, I've got two case studies here where we, uh, where we tested this. The first one was done in the UK around the issue of Brexit, uh, and I'm sure most of you know that this is quite a divisive issue in this country between the side that wished to remain in the European Union and the side that wished to leave it. So this is how we operationalize the headlines I was talking about in the last slide. And we created mirror versions of each one so that it would be tailored to whichever side the participant was on. So the critical thing here is that we always showed um, a headline that was uh, sort of negative towards the opposite side of the issue. So for example, people who wanted to remain in the European Union got shown headlines in the effective condition. It was attacking um, Brexiters, the people who wanted to leave in the um, issue-based, so non-derogatory uh, condition, it would have, the, these headlines would have been um, sort of not positive about Brexit, but make, more focused on the issue. And then the ones that the people who wanted to leave the EU were shown would just be the opposite, uh, targeting the remainers and so on and so forth. So showing now the results, so we did two experiments on this. Uh, and you can see here from the first one, we have two main effects of interest. So first I'll talk about the inoculation effect. Uh, the people who watch the inoculation video, which is shown on the left side uh, of the axis, they uh, were much less likely to engage. So I'm showing in sort of combined engagement score from the clicking and the sharing intentions here. So the uh, video was effective at reducing it, but for both types of headlines. Now this was quite interesting because we saw that people were less likely to want to share the effective headlines. So these were the ones derogating the outgroup, um, which is the line that you see in blue, and they were less likely to want to, sh um, to engage with it, sorry, uh, than the other issue headlines. So, and there was no reinteraction between them. So basically the inoculation video was reducing engagement with both types of headlines. Um, so we replicated this again, but we updated the video a bit to try and make it a bit stronger. So we introduced some like polarization words uh, to be made as part of the warning in the video. So that's an example of a frame that we added to this, this, um, in this replication study. And again, we see the results. Uh, I mean, if we're talking replication, that's pretty, that's pretty similar. So same thing, we found a significant effect where the inoculation video reduced uh, the, uh, the intents to engage with the um, information, but the uh, effective headlines were still shared less than the issue-based ones overall, and there was no interaction. Okay, so moving on to case study two, now we went over to the US, and we conducted this uh, together with the US Polarization Research Lab, um, and we ch choose, chose a different issue, because Brexit doesn't really mean that much in the US, uh, and we chose a pretty divisive issue as well because this is about abortion um, and as many of you in this space will also know, this is a very polarization, uh, polarizing issue in the US, around, especially around the recent Roe versus Wade um, legislation, let's say. So uh, it's also an issue that's very much split along political lines, so we did the same thing here, mirror stimuli for two, uh, the dem uh, participants who were Democrats and Republicans, where the effective headlines were always targeting and really derogating the out group, so the other, the per people on the other side of the issue, and then the issue-based headlines weren't 
weren't positive about it, but they were not attacking inflammatory, uh, using inflammatory language or anything like that. Okay, so very quickly now on results. Now this is a little bit different from what we found in the UK. Good, the good thing is the inoculation video still works. It's still successful at reducing engagement. Um, but we do find here that uh, the US participants tend to, to engage more with the effective content. So that's the blue line. You can see it more cl clearly on the control side where the blue bar's higher than the orange one. Um, and perhaps this might be why we see an interaction here uh, where the inoculation video was more successful at reducing engagement with the effective content than with the only issue-based content. So to quickly sum up, um, we found that the inoculation video was consistently reducing sharing of the headlines. In the UK, this was only really, uh, this was the same for both types of headlines and the participants tended to share the, uh, to engage with the issue-based ones more than the effective ones. However, we did find the interaction with an interaction with the US experiment where the inoculation video uh, was more effective at reducing engagement with the effective based headlines. Uh, however, we do note that this may also be because there's more to work with with the US sample who were more likely to engage with those effective headlines in the first place. So I guess overall takeaway here is that a mis uh, an inoculation video that warns people about sort of the polarizing rhetoric that's used could be a feasible intervention, but I will stress this is still only lab work and it'd be very interesting to see how it plays out in the real life online environments uh, that we are in. Um, thank you very much. Wonderful, do we have any questions? One sec. Oh, God, I'm stuck. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. It's just a very small uh, follow-up on your presentation. Uh, I didn't really understand. Is it a good outcome if uh, the inoculation reduced the engagement with the issue-based headlines? Like, I didn't read all the issue-based headlines, but were there, there were, like, neutral information about politics, basically? So ideally, we want to have what we found in the third experiment, so the case, this case study of US, like that was, that's the ideal condition where it does reduce uh, the effective, so reduce engagement of the effective stimuli, but not so much the um, issue base, because we do still want people to engage. Um, so it's interesting because we have that base condition already that we see in the UK, which is people are already not engaging as much with the effective stimuli, and we could we could maybe look at the fact that it was done, so we did that experiment in 2021, I think, or early 2022, and that was several years after. I mean, I know that it was quite a long drawn out process and there was still a lot of bad feeling, but that in itself is indicative of perhaps how much less willing people are to be, get into the whole effective side of things. But in a very fresh issue where tempers are running high, we do find that interaction effect we're hoping for. So it may be something to speak to as to the timing of when you want these warnings to go out mm -hmm. before the issue has already been, I don't know, bashed to death in a way. Thanks. Any other questions? I was, I was wondering, not related more to the speaker that was speaking before you, and we were talking about going through the rabbit hole. I'm wondering how many of you actually went through the rabbit hole and what did you think about it? In terms of the very limited way that we define it, I'm confident that I have not. Um, the, in terms of a, a broader way of uh, coding and thinking about not just within politics but across other issues, maybe? I, you know, I still hold out hope that I'm you know, <clears throat> getting exposed to ever more extreme uh, crazy cooking techniques, but you know, so far I'm not getting them so much, unless you think sous vide is a Oh, a very out there cooking technique, but I don't think it is. I can actually speak a bit to that because I spent my summer going into TikTok rabbit holes with my research assistants. Um, and actually it was interesting. So we set up six different research profiles with different interests and we were supposed to just swipe through. So you don't TikTok, you just sort of keep going through the videos. Um, 
I got assigned a health and vaccine related, oh, it was re really quick, you got into things that were increasingly intense and anti-vaccine um, and political. The one account that didn't go anywhere near any of that stuff was cooking. So maybe that's just a safe space. <laughs> But we had the same with like gender issues um, and uh, even relationships or celebrity gossip. I think they went straight down the, I think, um, feminism and anti-feminism rabbit hole there. So some, I, I guess it's good news that there are some safe spaces out there in, on TikTok, but other spaces maybe not so clean, especially as we're not so delineated where we only want one thing. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Um, so it's for the second speaker of the day. Um, you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned about a little bit about algorithm transparency. Um, how would you control IP? And in addition to that, the adversarial attacks that would involve that kind of um, release of IP itself and releasing your algorithms into the public, uh, or at least for research community itself. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't really understand your question, because, partly because I'm trying to look at you and there's this blazing. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, no, but uh, can you maybe um, repeat and try and... Yep. Um, so you mentioned algorithm transparency. Yeah. So uh, by that I took that as revealing how the algorithm functions and how you uh, use that to push uh, different kind of videos to uh, videos or different kind of um, contents yeah. to your Correct. user base. How would you uh, protect your IP in that case? And how would that affect um, adversarial attacks in terms of misinformation or disinformation um, by uh, malicious users? Um, so I think that when we're talking about algorithmic transparency, uh, what's important for, um, for us is that you would know why you're being targeted for a specific ad or a specific message. So um, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to, uh, to answer your question, but I, I do want to say that um, when, when it comes to, to transparency and, or so, we, we don't think that we, you should censor anything or you, you, you won't allow any particular messages. At, at least not, this is not the, uh, the way that we're uh, trying to go. Um, what we do want is to boost people to make their own informed decisions. And when you have this online space that you have been um, with all sorts of messages and all sorts of uh, micro-targeted uh, ads and, and um, and information that's supposed to target you specifically and maybe push some psychological buttons, um, it's important to know why you're being um, uh, targeted th those specific messages. And, and maybe that could help people bring to their attention uh, that they're being uh, manipulated. And we know that from uh, different experimental, um, different uh, experiments and studies that show that um, when you tell people about the, just the fact that you're being, um, say, a high or low on a certain personality scale, you're less uh, susceptible to, uh, to ads that are supposed to target those uh, audiences. Yeah, I can, is this on? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> just to add to that, I think it's a, uh, you make a good point. And one of the forms of transparency that we're most interested in um, is access by independent researchers to what the algorithms do so they can be audited. Um, now, that doesn't translate into making everything available to bad faith actors who can then exploit that. Uh, the point of having independent audits is just so that the public knows what is going on on the platforms, whereas at the moment, uh, it's entirely opaque. And so the recent initiatives by the EU are pointing in that direction because they're now basically expecting the platforms to make their algorithms accessible to researchers. And uh, protecting profits is not a good reason for the platforms to withhold access in the future. And I think that allows the public to have some 
control over what's going on while at the same time not opening the door as you were afraid of uh, to bad faith actors to reverse engineer that. Um, any other questions? Okay then, thank you so much to all the speakers, that was wonderful. We'll move on to the next session soon. <laughs>